Thanks. Let's begin. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this morning, Lord. I just thank you again for these students. I just pray that you just uh, guide our thoughts today, help us to uh, glorify you again, Lord, in what we do. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Um, so I will take homework questions from you guys in just a second. I need to make uh, a minor correction to yesterday. Ahem. These are the sorts of corrections you guys should be making. As you know, I am human. I do make mistakes. And when I did the Weierstrauss substitution, it wasn't even yesterday. It was like two days ago, actually, right? I neglected this half, which is bad, because when we differentiate tangent of x over 2, chain rule says there's another half, right? So if you tried to compare the formulas I put boxes around um, with what's in the book, you'd find there's a 2 missing, because I neglected the chain rule here. Otherwise, otherwise it was fine. And I, I, I propagated that mistake to the example I did. Um, so there's like some twos missing in that example we did. Let me, so um, just to uh, kind of show you another correct example of Weierstrauss substitution, let's look at this integral. Integral of dx over 2 plus cosine of x. So let's, let's look at this example. Yes, sir? <laughs> Thank you. See, that's how it's supposed to work in here. <laughs> let's see here. <laughs> so. All right, so then what? Well, this is a rational function of sine and cosine. It's hard to th see the sine, um, but it's, it's there. It's just been set to zero. Um, <laughs> I sometimes tell this r related stupid joke. I had a, a graduate course in numerical methods, and this guy is like, you know, like, you know, elephants have wings. And we're like, what are you talking about? First of all, it was very hard. To, he has a, this guy has a very, very, very significant stutter. So like understanding, first of all, so you don't think he's going to be talking about elephants because this is a class where we talk about phonons and other like weird, you know, group properties of crystals and stuff. So he's like, you know, no, uh, elephants have the wings. Like, so we finally figured out he's saying elephants have wings. We're like, what? He's like, yes, they're just set to zero. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. In the same way, there's a sign here. Um, but uh, that was his point, was we were working on something where a certain feature of a more general model was, was absent because it had been set to zero. I remember it. It worked. Let's see here. So <laughs> I, don't remember, I, don't, I don't remember what else we were talking about that day, but I remember the stupid joke. Let's see here. So. Um, what you do is use this Weierstrass substitution, right? And so dx is what? 2 du over 1 plus u squared, and then divided by what? <coughs> 2 plus, right? What's cosine x? 1 minus u squared over 1 plus u squared, right? That's my code. Oh, yeah, you guys were about, you guys soon will harass me about something else that's wrong here, right? I'm, I'm, I'm checking on whether or not you're following along or just taking what I say and without, without some kind of critical thinking. Critical thinking <laughs> it requires I delete what from the other lower two boxes? <laughs> the what? Right, right. These are very lopsided equations. The one side is finite. The one side is finite. The other side is infinitesimal. N not a good thing. <laughs> okay, there we go. Fixed. All right. Ah, so now we can do what? Clear. Yeah, clear out the denominator. This gives us integral of. 2 du 
over 2 um, plus 1 minus u squared what? Oh, thank you. Something, something seemed wrong. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's 2 times 1 plus u squared. Yeah, we actually have to think about it. Um, when I multiply through the denominator, of course, it also multiplies the 2. Thank you. So, and then plus 1 minus u squared. All right, so we can clean that up a bit. What do we actually have? We have 2u squared minus u squared, which is u squared, right? Plus 3. So to do this integral, we can make a tangent substitution, right? u equals the square root of 3 um, tangent theta. With this trig substitution, we get u squared plus 3 equals to what? We get 3 secant squared theta, right? And du is the square root of 3 secant squared theta, d theta. So with this, with this trig substitution, this becomes um, the integral of 2 square root of 3 d theta. divided by 3, because the secant squared cancels. Right, there's a secant squared theta upstairs. There's a secant squared theta downstairs. They, they cancel out. Because this, this is, I mean, this is an inverse tangent. We could have done this back in chapter 7 before we knew about uh, trig substitution. In fact, we did. We, 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 we factored out a 3 and we made like a, a w equals u over three kind of u over square root of three kind of substitution or something like that. Um, okay, so then what? This of course is what? This is two two square root of three over three theta plus a constant, right? And then we can unwrap this. This is two square root of three over three. Theta is what? Theta is inverse tangent of u divided by the square root of three. Right? And then we're not done yet. We still got to go back and put back in the, vi the Weierstrass substitution, which is 2 squared of 3 over 3 inverse tangent of um, tangent of x over 2 divided by the square root of 3 plus a constant. And, and I, will, I will have pity on you and not try to simplify that further. I do think we could, but I will. I will call it a day right there. I mean, you could use trig identities in the triangle to probably change that to some kind of algebraic expression if you were so inclined. OK, so that, that's, I thought I owed you another example of that. And uh, Dr. Skimbordas had told me this one was really fun. I mentioned it yesterday. So th there it is. It's not, not too bad. All right, now that I got that out of my system, your homework questions. And then once, once that's done, we still have one little bit kind of of new, new stuff to talk about, which is the uh, how do you estimate the error in the rules we discussed yesterday, right? Which is also in your homework, so we'll, we'll see if maybe you'll ask me about that. What, what's your question? Um, 8.5. Uh-huh. 8. So 8.5. Number 8. By the way, guys, I think I'm going to uh, take my book back from the math department, so I'm not going to leave it there anymore. I don't think any of you are using it. Is that fair? So I'm, I'm going to take it back to my office now. It has been sitting over in the math department for you guys to borrow, but it's cool. So you got 1 over x times x squared plus 1 quantity squared, right? Yeah. So I like plugged in. Um, oh, 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 oh just, just a second. Now are you actually supposed to find it? Find the partial fractions decomposition. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, no. 
now, now hold on just a second. What was your, uh, what, what, what did you think, uh, what, what, was your, what was your template? Okay. Uh huh. Excellent. That's exactly the right thing to do. No problems there. So mm -hmm. Then I like plugged in everything new and I got 8.1. But then if you do the power thing, it's just I mean 8.0, I think. But it's only like two. Well, I mean, um, I suppose it's possible that A could be zero. Um, Uh oh, so what, what did what did you do? Like I plugged in x equals zero. What, what, now, when you say you plug in x equals zero, let me let me take one more step because otherwise I don't think we can figure out. In, in order to understand each other, I think we're gonna have to take one more step. So this is a times x squared plus one squared um, plus b x plus c times x times x squared plus one plus d x plus e um, times x. A, you had A times X squared plus one cubed, but why would we have that? See, what? Uh, how to get from, here, tell you what, let me just, um, let me multiply this. Let me just do it, okay? Let me, let me work out the steps here for just a second. X times X squared plus one quantity squared, right? So over here, I'd have to do what? X times X squared plus one quantity squared. So of course, this gives us what? you allow me this manga style calculation, one, right? Over here, we distribute. Now this is the step I haven't written down because I don't think writing it down really gets you much except a lot of writing. And so I have been modeling the idea that if you think carefully, you can do this step in your head without writing. Now, that, that may or may not be a fair uh, assumption um, for, I mean, there, I don't know. You know, writing helps and hurts and uh, that's, that's, that's part of, uh, you know, maturing in here is learning what, what you should write and what you shouldn't write. Now, now, me as a student, I always wrote way too much. But eventually it dawned on me that I had friends who wrote less and thought more, and they could calculate way faster than I could, and actually more reliably than I could. Because my writing, while comforting, is also prone to make errors. But that, that's actually what's going on. This blue is actually what's going on to get to here, right? That's the, the in-between step that I almost never write. So what, what's happening? X is canceling. That leaves me with precisely that, right? See? Now this one, what cancels? Right, so we could kind of think of that as the canceling the two. So we're just left with these guys which is what I wrote over here. And then this one, exactly, the whole thing cancels and we're just left with the, with the X. But that wasn't your question, was it? Oh, wait a minute. You guys have to wear different colored shirts and like sit further apart. <laughs> it's very confusing to me. You need to look different, more different. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so racist of me. Let's see, I'll let you white people look the same. Let's see here. Um, sorry. I don't think we're allowed to say that sort of thing anymore. <laughs> um, hmm. So you, you got to here, but you're still having trouble? Okay, what, now when you put x equal to zero, what happens? Okay, so what's the problem? Well, okay, so you're, 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 first of all, x equals to zero yields one is equal to a times one squared, right? 
which tells me that a is equal to 1. That is, in fact, correct. I mean, I don't see any error with that. Now, what was the other thing you did? Was to foil it out? I mean, you say power method. What do you, what do you mean by that? Oh, so you're saying like to equate coefficients. So what, what equate, equate coefficients of what, what power of x were you thinking of equating? Uh, so you wanted to look at x to the fourth, OK. x to the fourth. So 0 on this side, right? And then, OK, so on the other side, we have where, where do we have x to the fourth? We have on the one hand a, right? Yeah. That's fine. Because this gives me x squared squared, which is x to the fourth. Where else? But here's the thing: is that's not the only x to the fourth. Where's the other x? Where, where are there other? X? Now there's no x to the fourth in this third term. Yeah, but but here, x x x squared, so plus b. Now, I see why you thought a was zero if you missed the b, right? But once you see that. It's even better, because that means you know b is equal to what? Um, yeah. So that's good. You're about 90% of what you're doing is right. You just made one small mistake, which confused you. Yeah? <coughs> other, other questions? Yeah. This was 8 point what? Yeah, some people would refuse to cover the integral of secant until they cover partial fractions. Because if you look at this, this is really what? This is really integral of, you know, 1 over cosine of x dx. And if we multiply that by sine x, we get sine x dx over, um, oh, sorry, multiply by cosine x, right? That gives us cosine squared x, which gives us what? 1 minus sine squared x, right? Which is the integral of du over 1 minus u squared, and then partial fractions, OK? Which is rather different than what we did before, which was to let u equal secant plus tangent, right? Now, you, you did that, I think, already. No, I just used Weierstrauss. Oh. Oh, Weierst Weierstrauss is, man, this Weierstrauss is like, it's a sledgehammer. It, it just it will destroy anything in its path. You know, I have, this is the first time, guys, I've ever just taught Weierstrauss like it's part of the material. And so it's opening. I, I have not, it has not dawned on me that these other problems that I have various special tricks to solve, like this one, right? Are now, are now just done with that thing. OK, so, but anyway, you still got to something like this. Yeah. So what was the, inter, what, what the answer, answer you got to was what? Uh, I mean, but what was the actual? You, you said you got to something, but it didn't match the answer. Uh, the answer I got was natural law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Say again? I mean, how? Could you u minus, one u, plus one. u minus one over u plus one? But I, I um, what was your, what was your u? Uh, one one. Oh, Perfect yeah, Weierstrass. yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in fact, so oh, yeah, I'm I'm dumb. Th this you can sorry, ignore this. This is not helpful to the problem. Uh, I'm thinking of another world of thinking Th that's not relevant. This problem is about Weierstrauss, obviously. Um, Thomas has the right idea because, I mean, look at the tangent x over 2 in the answer you're supposed to find. It, it screams Weierstrauss, doesn't it? Okay, sorry. I, I was just reading something online about this earlier. It's in my, it's in my, it's on, on my brain. Um, so what's the problem?
Right. Well, there's absolute value bars around this, right? Um, so actually, the, um, it, it is not what's in the book, right? But here's, here's a fun fact for you. Uh, if I have minus A over B, absolute value, it's the absolute value of A over B. So like absolute value eats minus signs. So if I want to, I can rewrite this just by properties of absolute value as um, 1 minus the tangent of x over 2 over 1 plus the tangent of x over 2. So I think you are just one step away from the answer. So. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, it's worse, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Still not what we want, is it? No, that's not it. Sorry, I, I thought it was just that. But the answer is it's worse, right? It's the, the minus has gone to the denominator, huh? Right? Yeah. So that's that's not the that's not the issue. All right. Well, let's see here. I am, of course, assuming that you did the wire strauss substitution correctly. So if you've done the wire strauss substitution incorrectly, you checked it twice. Anybody else come to the same point? Mm, okay. Let's see here. How can we make the minus go downstairs? Let me try something. So if I've got tangent x over 2 minus 1, I, I, I'm, I'm just, I don't know. Maybe something like, I don't know. I'm, I'm at a loss in terms of uh, trigonometric manipulations at the moment. So the thing we can do to see if your answer is the same as the book's answer, when I get pushed into this corner, what I do is I differentiate the answer, right? So if the derivative of your answer and the derivative of the book's answer is the same, that means that there is some algebraic manipulation which <laughs> will allow us to rewrite it that way. And you got to remember that you can do things like add numbers even to the antiderivative. It would still be the same antiderivative. So there's, there's a certain freedom here, which isn't just strict equality. This is what you got, right? So let's differentiate it. Let me call this thing Pac-Man. All right, so the derivative Pac-Man with respect to x, what do I get? 1 over that monstrosity. I'm going to ignore the, ignore the absolute value signs for the sake of not going nuts. Let's see here. Um, then I got to do what? Quotient rule, right? So that's uh, 1 half secant squared x over 2 times tangent of x over 2 plus 1 minus 1 half secant squared x over 2 times the tangent of x over 2 minus 1, all divided by tangent of x over 2 plus 1 quantity squared. Hmm. Does that simplify? Well, the secant squared tangent terms do cancel out, don't they? And um, you're just left with what? You got yourself a secant squared x over 2 upstairs. Because you got a half plus a half, the secant squared tangent terms cancel. This clears out some of the initial denominator, right? Well, in fact, it gives us what? It gives us tangent x over 2 minus 1 times what? 
times tangent of x over 2 plus 1, which might simplify. What's that? So I've got myself tangent squared x over 2 minus tangent x over 2 plus tangent x over 2 minus 1. How are secant and tangent related? Oh man, I would like to make that minus into a plus. Well, that would be very disturbing if I could do that actually though. So I don't know. We say tangent squared is secant squared theta minus 1. So this is something like secant squared what? Well, I mean, I guess I could simplify it slightly further. So the secant squared of x over 2 over secant squared x over 2 minus 2, right? Yeah. Now, I would have to differentiate the book's answer and see if I got the same thing. That, that was your, your answer, right? So the book had what? It had um, one plus the tangent of x over two, one minus the tangent of x over two. <sighs> so again, I get one over this thing. And then times what? Times the quotient rule, which gives me one half secant squared x over two times um, one minus tangent of x over two minus um, one plus the tangent of x over two times the derivative of the bottom, which is minus one half secant squared x over two, all divided by the denominator squared, which is one minus tangent of x over two, golly, squared. Does this simplify to the same thing? It might. You notice the, the um, we only have what? We, we end up with the same denominator, yeah. We're going to again get 1 plus tangent x over 2 times 1 minus tangent x over 2. The um, square reduces, right? They, so we get the same denominator as we did in the previous time. And the numerator also has got the uh, minus secant squared tangent plus secant squared tangent. The secant squared tangent terms cancel. And we're left also with 1 half plus 1 half. Yes, these are equal. The derivatives match. So they're the, they're the same antiderivative. So there's some trigonometric manipulation you can make of your answer to get the book's answer, I believe. I don't see it this morning, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. Yep. In the top one, the, the, the e top derivative, um, how did it become tangent of x over 2 minus 1? It's a quotient rule, is long story short. All right, I think I have spent already too much time on this problem, <laughs> so I'm going I'm to go on. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to ask, did you multiply it by that, the first part? Because it, like, to me, it just looks like you just did product rule, and then you just forgot to multiply it by the 1 over x, um, 1 over 1 half x, I mean, tangent of 1 half x minus 1 over tangent. Well, what I'm doing here is the chain rule for the natural log function, followed by the quotient rule, because the derivative of the inside function for the natural log is a quotient. And I did that for both of these. I'm not sure if I understand. Your so thing is, if you see right, the part right after the equal sign, that the derivative of the natural log function, did you multiply it by the chain rule? Because I just, to be honest, I can't follow that. If 
So you're saying this one? That one? That one. So you're saying this right here is the inside function, so 1 over the natural log, and then this whole thing is the derivative of that. Yeah, yeah, over here. Okay, I just couldn't follow up. Oh, no, well, this square cancels that down there. Okay. And then I've got tangent x plus, tangent minus, tangent plus. Okay. And the same thing happens down here, but for opposite reasons. Here I've got 1 plus tangent. The 1 minus tangent cancels with that one, and, but you're still left with 1 plus tangent, 1 minus tangent. Um, oh, is there a minus difference? Yeah. Ah, there may be a different, there may be a, huh. Oh, anyway, th th uh, I'm going I'm to go on to other questions. I, we've, we've spent enough time on this one. I'm, uh, you're on the right path. You're close. I, um, <coughs> I would consult professional help, as in I would check your answer against Wolfram Alpha or something. Oh. Hey, stop me. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it would have been faster just to try the wire straw <laughs> substitution again <laughs> from the start to check your work. But this is a useful, uh, this is not a worthless conversation we're having here. This is an important thing to know about. When we get answers which seem different, we can check derivatives. It seems you're off by a sign. Because I have neglected to notice that this, this is, in fact, different. This one simplifies to tangent squared minus 1. This one actually simplifies to 1 minus tangent squared, which is off by, it's otherwise the same, but it's off by minus. So I think we have to multiply your, we multiply your answer by minus 1. You're missing a minus, and it flips the fraction. It's a natural log. So yeah, you're miss, somehow you've missed a minus in the calculation, and all that, that's all that's needed, because that turns us over. <coughs> well, I feel better. All right. Please ask me another question before I say more about this. <laughs> yes. Um, Save me from this problem. 8.5 number 20. Uh, 0.5 number 20. I get to a certain point, and then when I'm trying to plug in x values to find a, b, c, d, mm -hmm. there becomes a point where like, I can't pick an x value. It just takes away the log log. Ah. Uh, yeah. I can find b and d, but I can do it. Let's see here. So you, you, you tell me what, we had what, 2x? Um, oh, I think I can erase. So t tell me the starting point was what, 2x? 2x minus 1 over x plus 1 squared times x minus 2 squared. OK, so we never worked one quite like this. Now you're, you're going to, I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring the integration aspect of it. Of course, the whole. Most of the, 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 most of the problem is just to find the partial fractions, right? So let me focus on that, that piece of it. This was what, section 8 point? Number 20. OK, so let me, let me try, to, try to help you out with this one. So you did this, right? Just to make sure we're on, we got the right starting point. Now, if you change, if, were your letters different than mine? I can make my letters match your letters. Okay. So then, multiply by the denominator. Are we still in agreement? Or? Let me call this thing Pac-Man. So Pac-Man does not get any indigestion when it eats minus 1 or, or, uh, or 2, right? So like minus 1 gives me minus 3 is equal to what? So all of 3, it just leaves us the B term, right? B is equal to what? Well, <laughs> yeah, B times, oh, what do you say that is? Oh, minus 3 squared, OK. 
So b is equal to what? Minus 1 third, you say? OK, I agree. If we feed it 2, we get 4 minus 1. This is 0, 0, 0. We get d times what? Times 3 squared, right? d is equal to? 1 third, OK, great. Off, well, that, that's half the problem down, right? Past this point, there's a variety of different things you could try. Um, pretty much pick any other two values besides minus 1 and 2. It'll work. It won't be nice. It'll give you a system of two equations and two unknowns. You'll have to solve them. That's one way we could do it. So for example, I am lazy. So I would feed Pac-Man 0, and I would feed Pac-Man 1. Because 0 and 1 are nice for arithmetic. 0 gives me minus 1 is equal to what? Well, let's see here. That's what? That's 4a plus 4b minus 2c plus d, which is actually what? Well, I'm not going to write that out. I'll just say you can go, f you can go on from there. All right, that gives you an equation. Well, you, you, d you don't yet. You don't yet. You don't yet. We have to have a little bit more patience for this one. We have to keep going. Algebra will fix it. 2 minus 1 is 1, right? And then plugging in 1, I got to think a little bit harder here. Um, pl put in 1, that's 1. This is 2, so I get 2a. This gives me, be careful, b. This gives me minus, minus 2c. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, let me just cheat here for a second here. Minus 1 times 2 squared, right? 1 plus 1, yeah, so minus 4c. And then this gives me what? 4d. OK, so you could, of course, don't be fooled. We already know the values of b, right? And we know the values of d. So if you look at this, this is actually two equations, two unknowns, right? So we can solve. You can eliminate one variable and solve for the other. That's one way you could do it, all right? An alternative method, an alternative method of finishing this problem, which might be easier. I don't know. Let's try it out. Let's see if we like it or not. What if we try my differentiation trick? If we take the derivative of Pac-Man, what do we get? Oh, yeah. See, we got we to gotta work a little bit to take the derivative this time. It was easier in the example I did this before, because in the example I did before, we just had that one root cubed. But when we have two roots, we're going to have to do product rule. Now, the question you got to ask yourself, would you rather do a little bit of difficult differentiation and have easy algebra, or would you rather do no differentiation and have slightly harder algebra? Th those, are your, those, are the, I mean, those are the plans as I see it. So this is a times what? x minus 2 squared plus 2 times x plus 1 times x minus 2 by the product rule plus 2 times x minus 2 times b plus c times x plus 1 quantity squared plus 2 times x minus 2 times x plus 1 plus 2 times x plus 1 times d. Now that, that took me some mental effort, those differentiations, right? But once you have that, it's easy to find nice equations, right? Like Pac-Man eats. Now it, the derivative of Pac-Man, it, 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 it does enjoy eating, again, the number 2 and, and, and minus 1. So minus 1 gives me what? Is that going to be nice? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. What does it give me? So this is gone, right? So all these terms with x plus 1 are just gone. Yeah. And you can just focus in on the uh, x minus 2 terms, which is what? So two. 
2 times minus 3, right, times b. Gone, gone, gone. Well, that's pretty nice because we already know b, so that gives us an, e that gives us an equation for a straight up. It's, I mean, it, it comes at a cost. The cost is differentiating. And if you feed Pac-Man prime 2, you get 2 equals, well, so that's gone, that's gone, that's gone, gone. All you're left with is C times 2 plus 1 squared plus 2 times 2 plus 1 times D, right? But you already know D, so that gives you an equation for C. So, yeah. I don't know, which, which method is better? I don't have a clear opinion on this. I mean, you can go either way. <clears throat> you could dispute my choice of, I mean, where did 0 and 1 come from is really the question, right? I just guess those numbers because they're easy to do arithmetic with, right? All right, let me, I do still need to cover something today. I think I have time for one more homework question, though. It shouldn't take me too long to cover the new material today. Is there another question? Okay. Well, maybe you'll have more questions tomorrow. It's cool. Come on. You can do it. Ah, very good. <laughs> so, the thing I want to talk to you today about in the time that remains I think I'm going to leave this one. I think I should keep this for next. I should keep this one for the next section. That's a pain to write out again. All right, <laughs> so error estimates. So, you know, we have these different approximation rules, right? And um, so, like, for example, you could look at Simpson's rule of order n minus the integral from a to b of f of x dx, right? And the absolute value of this thing would be what you might call the, the error. Um, there may be a sub n on that. depends on your, uh, your notation. Now, here we're talking about, of course, the theoretical error. It's just the, the raw mathematical difference between the actual integral and, say, Simpson's rule of order n. By the way, I said something about Simpson's rule only being good for, for even, even numbers of intervals. That's nonsense. I'm, I don't know what I'm remembering that from, but quite clearly the book has formulas that work for odd n as well. So like that is not part of it. So this is, would be the error in Simpson's rule. Um, if we look at the trapezoid rule of order n, the difference between the trapezoid rule of order n and the actual integral, well, that, that was, that's called the error in the trapezoid rule. And we usually use it with epsilon. So there's a, there's a theorem, which <laughs> we, we will not derive. <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe uh, I wonder if Dr. Wang, Dr. Wang might possibly do this, um, derive these results in um, perhaps in the numerical methods course we have here, Math 352. Um, by the way, uh, that for those of you who are engineers and um, people who are going to be doing applied math um, in industry and such, the numerical methods course is, is so very important. Um, it's one of the stronger things you could do to strengthen your resume as you leave here. Uh, people have gotten hired or not hired on the basis of taking or not taking that course. And that, that's not an exaggeration. Um, Okay, but uh, I mean, th the, that, that course, 352, is really about the intersection of calculation and computing in part, right? It's actually how to use computer in part to do some calculations and study how, how much in error you are and things like that. Numerical methods. 
So um, it doesn't get much more real world than that. <laughs> so anyway, here's the rule. The, the um, sorry, this one, the trapezoid rule. Oh, well, he has, he has special notation for these. Generically, I would call it epsilon, but he calls this the error in Simpson's rule of order n. This is the error in the trapezoid rule of order n. And here's the theorem. The, um, you can bound the error in the trapezoid rule of order n. The absolute value of that is less than or equal to b minus a cubed divided by 12n squared times m, where m is a bound on the second derivative. So in other words, if you can tell me the second derivative is less than a specific value, then I can give you a, a precise account of how close the trapezoid rule is to the truth for a given value of n. And the corresponding error estimate, or error bound, for Simpson's rule of order n So the error has to be less than or equal to, I mean, there's actually an equality here in the use of the mean value theorem. I'm just writing. We can't usually find the uh, f of f, the fourth derivative of c equals to something. I mean, anyway, so I'm giving you the more useful form of it. There's a little bit more in the text, kind of like the mean value theorem. There exists a c such that there's a stronger result boxed on page 439. I'm just skipping over that and getting to the point, um, believe it or not. So there's a minus sign out here because that. Um, no, there's no minus. Uh, sorry, the minus is in the exact result I'm skipping over. B minus A to the fifth over 2,880. I mean, obviously, uh, n to the fourth uh, times m. Now this m is a bound on the fourth derivative of x. OK, so to put these error estimates into practice, we actually need to be able to bound um, the integrands, second or fourth derivatives in this way. I guess I have to come to terms with erasing that. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so one of your homework questions, right, in section, in the numerical section, is to, uh, to calculate the value of pi using Simpson's rule or trapezoid rule. All right, so here's number, number five in your homework asks the following. It says, okay, so the integral from zero to one of dx over 1 plus x squared should be equal to what? Well, you, you know it. This is what? This is uh, inverse tangent of x, right? Evaluated from 0 to 1, which is what? Inverse tangent of 1 minus inverse tangent of 0, which is what? Pi over 4, right? Now, imagine yourself in a world without pi, OK? Imagine you didn't know pi was 3.14159678443221077531011, like that, right? Suppose that wasn't the case. Then, um, so you didn't know that. Then, no one's going to correct me on the pi? You could use this, actually, to define pi, right? You could say, well, pi is four times that integral, right? And we could use a numerical method to calculate that integral. And if you know those theorems, you could say how far you were, how far you were from the real integral. And in so doing, you can arbitrarily approximate pi to whatever accuracy you do so desire. 
So like this, right? So what we're looking at then, so my question then is, the, your, 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 this question doesn't actually ask you to do this. I'm adding something to number five. Um, he says, look at the trapezoid rule. He, 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 he wants you to calculate um, the trapezoid rule with order six, with n equal to six, and, and b, he wants you to calculate Simpson's rule also with um, n equals to three. And he, he wants you to use those to estimate the value of pi. How, so what, I mean, just to, sorry, I'm taking the wind out of the sails of this problem. The point is you calculate t6, you calculate s3, and to approximate pi, you just multiply those by four, right? Okay, so my question though is slightly different. How far off can we expect t6 or s3 to be given the, the uh, error bounds I wrote over there? So I want to try to put those into practice and try to estimate how far off this integral is going to be explicitly. So let's, let's, let's study that. So here's my question. What is a good bound on the error in trapezoids rule with order six? And also, while we're at it, Simpson's rule with order three. I may regret this. So what do we have to study? We have to study f of x equals to one over one plus x squared, right? On zero less than or equal to x less than or equal to one. How do you put a bound? How do you find this m such that f prime prime of x is less than or equal to m? What do we, how, do we, how do you do that sort of thing? The answer is calculus one. You use basically the idea, the, uh, the ideas we learned for graphing with calculus, you know, about increasing and decreasing functions. And in view of that, you can come up with bounds. Um, so like here, let's, let me make sure you put that into practice. What's f prime of x? I may regret this example. <laughs> Minus two x over one plus. This isn't part of the homework. I'm adding to the homework, right? So f prime of x is minus 2x over 1 plus x squared squared. So the second derivative, <laughs> f prime prime <coughs> of x is what? All right, let's do it. So minus 2 times what? Times 1 plus x squared squared. Um, plus 2x, minus minus gives me a plus, um, and then twice times 1 plus x squared times 2x for the chain rule. All divided by, of course, 1 plus x squared to the fourth power. All right, can we clean that up? I think we can, I mean, we can make a cancellation here, right? Before we think about multiplying anything out, notice that this four can be put to a three if I also get rid of one power here and this factor, right? Because I've got a common one plus x squared factor everywhere that I can reduce that. And that I also have a two I can factor out. I'm going to factor that two out. Tell you, I'm a factor of really going to factor a minus two. Now I better factor a two out. I, I get in trouble with minuses. So I got a two over one plus x squared cubed, right? Times what? Times the numerator gives me what? Minus one minus x squared. This over here is just what? It's Two times, oh, I, I, I pulled one two out, so I got two x times, 
I've got 2x2, two two, so I got plus 4x squared, right? So we can simplify this, no? Yes? A little bit, let's clean it up. So I have twice, looks to me like 3x squared minus 1 divided by 1 plus x squared cubed. All right, and, and now I'm going to do some somewhat ad hoc analysis here. So what I'm about to do is not terribly rigorous, but it may be useful. 3x squared minus 1 is a parabola. It looks something like this, right? On the other hand, 1 plus x squared is a what? Right, like that. So if I want to make this fraction as large as it can possibly be on the interval from 0 to 1, what do I want to do? So I'm thinking about these values, basically. By the way, we get to ignore the sign. We're just looking at like absolute value eventually. OK. It's really the magnitude that matters. Hmm. Let's see here. If you put in 0, it's minus 1 up here, right? If you put in 1, it's 2. So I think this is going to be less than or equal to 2 times 2. I mean, 2 is as big as this thing gets from 0 to 1, right? It's between minus 1 and 2. 2 is the largest of magnitude it gets. Downstairs, what is, so to make the fraction as large as possible, we need to make this thing what? Small as possible. What's the smallest this can be? One, right. So in other words, I think this is about the best m I can get. I think this might even be strict. Uh, I mean, it might be a tight bound. Like, I can't do better. So I can use m equals to 4. <laughs> no. <laughs> Forget that. I'm not doing that. <laughs> no. <laughs> There's not time in here to do that. <laughs> That would be hard. <laughs> I'd have to calculate the fourth derivative and bound that. Ugh. I don't get paid enough for that. All right, so th this, is, this is it. All right, so what does that say then? If we apply the theorem, what's the theorem say? It says that the error in Simpson's rule, <laughs> trapezoid rule, <laughs> right, of order, what we say, six? Should be less than or equal to, what's the rule? What's the black box tell us? What's b and a? b here is 1, a is 0. So b minus a is 1. So I got 1 cubed divided by 12n squared. n was 6, right? And then times m, right? Which is what? 4. Obviously, the calculation of the bound on the derivative is the hardest part of this whole analysis, right? 